So today I'm going to be doing a presentation on how to uh, do an effective Bible study. And uh, this morning during Sabbath school, I shared that the, the key principle in having someone to st study the Bible with is relationship with Christ. You need to have a relationship with Christ before anything. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, if you want to share God to others, you need to have an experience with God. Amen? And so, um, and then once you build a relationship with Jesus, then you build relationship with others. And that's the, the, two, the key, two key things. Relationship with God and relationship with others. I think Jesus says something about that. And I want to make it clear that um, that when we study the Bible with someone, it's, uh, it's to uplift Christ. So, I'm not a Bible worker, right? Why should we give Bible studies at all? And the first uh, thing that I would tell you is that the, the best way to learn something is to teach it. And I know from experience that as I study with people, as I open up the Word of God to them, truths from the Bible become more personable to me than anyone else. And I, I just wanted to... Uh, I, I want to get this point across that when, when you, uh, I'm sorry, when you grow in Christ, right, when you're growing in Jesus, you, you can grow uh, better, if that's the way, when you're working for God. Uh, there's, only, there's only three ways to grow. Reading of the Word, prayer, and ministry. And that, that can mean anything. It's, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, let me give you a study on the 2300 days. But it, it can be any, any word you share to people. So the other thing is that the more you grow, the less it becomes about you and more about him. And that's the, the key thing in everything. We share the Bible not because it'll make me look good, but because it'll make God look good. Amen. So we want God to be glorified. I don't, I don't take any credit. It's all God. Amen. So, um, and, it, and these principles apply not just to formal Bible studies, because I know some of, them, uh, some of us can do that, but this can apply to any time we share something with someone that is from the Bible. So don't think, well, don't automatically shut off the brain and say, well, I'm never going to give a Bible study. Be a little open and say, all right, are there tips here that I can share with others about how God has blessed me. And this can be formal Bible study, informal, like, hey, you know what verse felt good to me today? And you read that verse. It could be a small group setting. So if you're thinking of starting a small group in your house, this, uh, these principles still apply. So I just want to make that clear that, you know, just because you don't feel like you're going to do a formal Bible study in the near future doesn't mean that uh, you can stop listening to Eddie. So... So we just read the story of Philip and the Ethiopian, and this is the, the main text we'll, we're going to be in today. And Philip gives a Bible study to the Ethiopian. They study the Bible together. And from, from that experience, uh, we, we get one the, the most central, I'm going to talk about it in a bit, but the most central piece is, is Jesus. This Bible study is very Christ-centered. The Ethiopian is uh, struggling to understand a prophecy in Isaiah, and God sends Philip. And God is doing that in our lives. There are people in our lives that are hungry for the Word of God. And we may not know it, but God is the one impressing in our hearts. So this is the other thing that I wanted to share, that I shared earlier, was that God will impress upon your heart with whom you should share. It's not something that we have to do. Again, I'm not... I'm not a big fan of guilt. I'm not going to guilt you to do anything uh, just because it doesn't work. Ask my mother. So I, I, want, I want you to understand that God is the one that's going to lead you into the work. Not Eddie. Eddie, Eddie can only take you so far. So um, I just want you to understand that, that God is directing our steps. And as God directs our steps... He will give us clarity and open up our minds to see which are the people that need to hear something from God and which don't. Okay, because again, it's very, it's, 
God has to be the director of our steps. All right, so the three principles in giving Bible studies. This is the first. Present Jesus first. All right, and this, this one is very uh, important to me because Jesus has to be the center of everything that we believe as Seventh-day Adventists. So uh, I want to ask you a question. This is kind of, I don't know, I might get excommunicated. What's more important, the Sabbath or Jesus? Good, good. You can. What's more important, our, uh, our the state of the dead or Jesus? Okay, so I won't get excommunicated. Beautiful. Right, we, we have to understand that Jesus trumps doctrine, and now everyone's saying red flags. What I mean by that is that if we just present the doctrine without Jesus, if, we, if we're doing a study on the Sabbath without leading people to Christ, it, it turns out to be a law-oriented instead of grace-oriented. You have to keep the Sabbath. Why? It's in the Ten Commandments. Okay. Instead of saying, well, I, I like to keep the Sabbath because, you know, it's, uh, I find that we can have rest, not just from all my labors, but rest in Christ. I can rest in the assurance that Christ has saved me. Now, which one sounds better? Yeah, the second one. Because, and, and this is the, b- the, the biggest thing, you know, that I find is like we have to get away from w- teaching truths, truths with an S. We have to teach truth with a capital T. Amen? We have to teach Christ, and then out of that teaching of Jesus, Jesus at the center of everything that we believe, then comes the Sabbath and whatever, you know, whatever happens when you die and hell and all these other things. So um, doctrine is important because it tells us about Jesus, but Jesus is the center. Jesus is at the very core. And if you, if you look back at our history, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you will find that during the Millerite movement, there was a group of people that wanted to be with Jesus. At the very core of what we believe as a church, before there was the Sabbath, before there was the sanctuary, before there was the gift of prophecy, there was one belief, one one uh, conviction. It was a desire to be with Jesus. And that's why the Millerite movement, um, they, they were excited to see the second coming of Jesus because they wanted to be with Christ. And it's out of that foundation, Jesus, that we are born. So I want, I want that to be clear because there, that makes all the difference. And I know you've met the the doctrine Adventists, the one that says, brother, <laughs> Sabbath, veganism, blah, blah, blah. So, and that, it's not in the spirit of Christ. There's no grace there because it's all about making you change so that you can be a cookie cutter version of whatever it is that they believe. But that's not what God is calling us to. God is calling us to have Jesus at our very core and he'll work out the rest. So, even when you're studying different things, I want Jesus should be the thing that you're studying the most. So how does Jesus relate to most of our doctrines as Adventists? How does Jesus relate to the experiences in my life? All right, Jesus at the center. And this is a big difference between the Pharisees and Jesus because the Pharisees were all about the don't do this, do that, don't do this, do that. And Jesus was all about come, come to me, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. All right, so Jesus at at the center. The second thing is uh, reveal truth gradually. All right, this one's very important. Let's tur- turn with me to Proverbs 4:18. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. It should be gradual. Okay? You don't want to overwhelm people with everything you know. Uh, it's it's scary. All right, just let's, let's, let's pretend I knock on your door and say, Hi, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. We believe in Jesus, but we also believe in the Sabbath, state of the dead, and hell. And, in, you know, as a matter of fact, we have a prophet, and that prophet is Ellen G. White. And let me tell you all her works. And, uh, oh, by the way, we're living in the end times. And uh, the, peace, the beast. So you see how that can get overwhelming and, ooh, weirdo. 
you know, that, that's like, that's, that's not the way God calls us to uh, reveal truth, all right? Jesus was very gradual when he taught the people. When you look at the disciples' life, he could have overwhelmed them and said, look, I'm not the Messiah that you expect. I'm the Messiah of the world, not just the Jews. And he could have said that flat out and he'd be right. But it would have been, you know, what do you mean you're not the Messiah we expect? They didn't get it after three and a half years of living with him. But for those three and a half years, they were learning and relearning and relearning their theology because they had it all wrong. But Jesus had to put the personal effort and reveal it gradually. And sometimes, you know, it says that he told them about the time he told them about his crucifixion and they didn't understand, and he'd kind of leave it alone. And then he'd come back a week later and say, well, guys, you know, as Noah, uh, I'm sorry, as Jonah was in the belly of fish, so will the Son of Man be. And they're like, what? And then they kept going, you know, and and it was so gradual, gradual. Uh, And uh, one of the things that is interesting is that we know where we are spiritually, right? Right? We know where we stand. And I think a lot of the times we're trying to get people to where we are right now. You know, and that's, while that's good intentioned, it's a little misguided. Because from the point where I am right now, God took, I don't know, 25 years? You know, four, I've been an, an Adventist for seven years, so it, it's taken at least all my life and those, that period of seven years to get me to the point where I am now. So if I were to go to someone and say, listen, I want you to come up to the place where I am right now, it's, gonna, it's, it's not going to work. Because God needs to work in that person the same way that he worked in you. And that's, that, this is important because sometimes we get discouraged and say, well, why isn't God doing like, boom, like me, right? Why isn't God working in that person like me? You see the focus there? Because... We, forget, we fail to realize that God took time to work on us unless we think we're God's gift to humanity and then, you know, there's no hope for you. But, so, I'm joking, I'm joking. So, uh, whenever, whenever you're doing uh, formal Bible studies or when you're leading someone to Christ, it's gradual, it's a process. That's why I don't subscribe to this uh, three months and boom, dip them in water and off you go, fly. That's, that's, not, that's not the method, you know. What if it takes a year? What if it takes two? What if it takes three to reach someone, you know? And I think, you know, what if someone struggles on the Sabbath? Do we just say, well, pss, peace out, man. I, I showed you truth. What are you going to do? Do you either accept or not? That's, that's misguided. So we have, to, we have to show people from the Word of God and be patient when we reveal things. So if someone is stuck, let's say, on the, you know, this is Sabbath, on the issue of the Sabbath, hey, man, I don't know why, you know, stay on the Sabbath for like four months and study the Sabbath. No one says you have to study everything in successive order. Does that make sense? So if you're studying the Bible, if you're studying about Jesus, um, realize that it takes time and you have to tell people, and it's, it's a gradual process. Amen? All right, so now uh, make, make uh, appeals for decisions. And this, this sounds weird, this sounds... But what it is, is you're calling people to a choice. Do you uh, accept what I just taught you? And you're presenting them, look, this is the way of the world and this is the way of God, and I'm showing you how God works. Okay, so an example of this would be, do you believe, like if you're studying with someone about Jesus... Do you believe that Jesus has died for your sins? Why or why not? It's, not? it's not as hard as we make it out to be sometimes. We don't have to say, you know, get on your knees right now and let me lay my hands on you. It's, it's more, you're saying, look, this, this, information, this information is good to me. Do, do you agree that uh, we need Jesus? You know, things like that, and it's little, little touching points. It's not, it's not so much saying, all right, if you don't accept this, Boom. Done. Does that make sense? So, the first principle was what? I'm asking you. Yeah, Jesus. Uh, The second one was? 
go slow. Yeah. And the third one is ask them ask them what they think. You know, what do you think about this? It's not you're not trying to trick people. This is this is the thing. You're not, you know, you're not trying to trick people into accepting something they don't want to believe. You're just showing them from the Bible what's true and you're asking them to make a choice on, hey, do you believe the Bible's true? Okay, then this is what the Bible says. Does that make sense? So it's not it's not trickery, it's not it's not like the your your door knocking for like salesmen. It's like I know you don't need this, but I'm gonna tell you why you should have it. It's it's we we agree that the world needs Jesus, right? The world needs Jesus. How are we gonna present Jesus to the world? That that's the principles behind this. It can be through our lives, through how we study, but it's it we're they need Christ and we need to call them to come to Christ. So uh, one of the questions that I get is what, what kind of study should I use? And we don't have to reinvent the wheel with this. We can pick the studies that are back there, the amazing facts. I know we've used them uh, many times and they're good. What I, what I like about them is that uh, they're very to the point and they have all the questions answered. There's also the search for certainty, uh, the search for certainty ones that are pure Bible, and then you just write it down and it's good. And or you can make your own personal one. Again, this is, I, I believe in personal, personal evangelism, personal studies, where you, on the go, you know, uh, if so if someone has a question, you can say, all right, you know what, we can study that. And then as you study it yourself and you teach it to someone else, it becomes ingrained in you. And you and you're able to teach. Does that make sense? So the best teachers are actually learners. So if you do go with the amazing facts ones or the ones that we have here, and you say, "Hey, I want to share this with you," use a couple of other texts that help you with the particular topic. And again, they should be Christ-centered texts. If you don't keep the Sabbath, you'll burn in eternity. So that that's the important the important aspect. Another, another uh, cool thing is when you add stories, it'll bring the Bible alive. You know, what is it that Jesus did when he, um, when he, was, in, when he was preaching? He told parables, right? Parables, stories. Because when you know a story, you, it's hard to forget it. And stories are, you know, we all live for a good story. Uh, so when when we tell people um, so something about the Bible, say a personal story. Say a story that helps you understand. Like, for example, there was this one lady who was, uh, we had this class, and she was giving me a Bible study practice. And her one illustration helped me more than whatever she said. She said that, uh, how does a worm get into an apple? We usually think that the worm comes in from the outside in, but what actually happens is that the worm is, as the apple is growing, it's actually born inside the apple, and so the worm eats its way out, and that's the picture of sin, how sin is born in us, and it eats a way out, its way out. And see, that illustration just brings alive the truth about sin. Does that make sense? Amen? All right. We've uh, promises. Now this is, you know, share promises of God that are helpful to you. Share things in the word that have been helpful to you. For example, one of the promises that I, um, this is my f- favorite one. It's in John, you don't have to go there, but John 6.37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. So see, there right there, that's a promise that you can share with people and say, look, you know, God will not cast you out. God loves you. And those biblical promises really help others get through the day. And um, again, this is all within the context of prayer. We need, to, we need to develop a prayer life so that when God asks us to do something, we're able to do it. And again, we only know the people to reach if we're praying. If there's, there's a, if there's a lack of prayer, we won't know who to, I mean, what should I do? Should I do, should I just go cold turkey, knock on doors, 
give them this tract and leave, or shall I pray, be their friend, and see what happens? And the, the, feel, the feel felt found thing here, that's, that's uh, it's, it's a coo cool tool in regards to promises, saying, look, you know, if someone has an objection and say, hey, uh, I, don't, I don't believe what you believe, say, look, I felt that way, but I found that God is good. Uh, I'm sorry, I've, I know how you feel. Uh, I messed it up. But, the, you know, I know how you feel. Th that's how I felt. This is what I found. And again, that's not gimmicky. It, what it is, is like you're really sharing with them what you've found in Christ. And this is why that relationship with Jesus is the most foundational aspect because you can't say that unless you have really found it. Unless, If you say it without finding it, that makes you a liar. And that, that's kind of touchy. But don't say things that you haven't, you know, don't say you found something that when you didn't. Does that make sense? So that's why the relationship with Jesus is foundational. All right. And this is where we get to the power of testimonies. So, yeah, sharing the word of God is all plain and good, but in order to get to this step and praying, there has to be a testimony in your life. And I'm not talking about how God saved you many years ago, but what is your testimony today of what God is doing in your life? And that testimony can be something verbal, like, you know, whatever, oh, God blessed me today with the beautiful sun. All right, whatever. But, no, 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 don't, don't take that the wrong way. But what I mean by that is, what, what does your life share about God? Okay, beautiful days are good. Please, don't, don't, mis, don't misunderstand me. You know, what is, what is your life saying that reveals about God? Because, listen, that is the most powerful testimony. That is the most powerful Bible study that you have. The life that you live, it's not so much. You can have all the knowledge of the world, but if you're a scoundrel, no one's going to accept what you believe. You know, or if you're other things. You know, I, I just think that we need to get away from this, this mentality that we as Adventists are intellectual believers, right? Everything we believe is up in here. There's no need for anyone else, right? But that's... You know, there has to be more than what we believe. If the only thing that makes me an Adventist is that I believe in the Sabbath, am I a good Adventist? Now we're getting philosophical. You know, what is it that, what is it that makes me a good Adventist? What is it that makes me a good Christian? Whatever you are, what is it that makes you a good, is it simply beliefs? Or is it the way you believe about your beliefs? The way you act your beliefs out? So as we experience God, you know, as we experience God and, our exp and we grow from our experience, that right there, that's, boom, powerful, powerful testimony. So, and again, this, when in your life, you know, or when you say a testimony, there shouldn't, there shouldn't be arguments. And I shared this in Sabbath school. Arguments get you nowhere, okay? And you can call my dad right now and he'll say, uh, he'll, he can tell. He can probably count off the times how many times I've argued with him on how the Sabbath is the seventh day. On this is what happens when you pass away. You know all these other things. He, he'll tell you, Eddie, man, I'm sick of hearing of these things. And we get back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This was when I was like zealous, back when, like when I first converted. Man, your idols, they're nothing. And then you know it's. While it's it's, I I see the. The heart's in the right place, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Does it, can anyone win an argument? No? Then why do we do it? Something to ponder. Um, all right, so now let's go through a few objections. A few objections. What if they say no? What if I'm trying to share something and they reject me? Has anyone thought that? Or am I the only one? I guess I'm the only one. All right, so this is what Michael Jordan says, uh, the most famous basketball player. He says this. You know, there was this, this clip of this video. He says that, uh, I can handle failure. What I can't handle is not trying. Or the other, the other, you know, Michael Jordan has this, like, wisdom. Sorry, I'm not preaching Jordan. I'm just saying he, there's things there. He says that... Um, you know, maybe, maybe I made it look easy. 
uh, maybe, maybe you think that this is God-given talent, but what you don't know is that I practice every day, and uh, this took time. So what, what I mean by that is that don't, don't, uh, don't be afraid to hear a no, because it's going to happen. Not everyone wants to hear what you have to say. And I know that's, that hurts me, because I'm like, I'm Eddie. How can you not hear what I have to say? But it's, we have to think that we have to keep praying even if they say no. And I know it's a little tough, but my father-in-law taught me something when I was, uh, he, he worked in sales and stuff like that, and he said that my goal when I was doing sales was to get 100 no's, and then maybe there would be a yes. And I just don't want a no or a rejection to say, well, this isn't for me. God can still use you, and in that person's life, or whatever it is that you're doing, if you stay um, in prayer. If you're not praying, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to like, it, be like a personal attack. But if you're praying, it, um, God will help you through it. Does that make sense? Sort of? I don't know what to say. Okay, so let's say, you know, I'm studying the Bible. You don't have to know everything. Amen? Do you have to know everything? No. You don't have to know anything, really, <laughs> except what God has shared, wh- except what God has done in your life. So, you know, if someone asks you a question that you can't answer, you can say, look, I don't know, but let me get back to you. I mean, there's no shame in that. And besides, it's, it's more real. It's more human. People don't want to talk to a know-it-all. Just, they, they, it comes across as snobby and, you know, well, if you know everything, why are you even talking to me? Does that make sense? So, we, th- yeah, it's about, it's about, you know, sharing what we have, and if we don't have it, we, we learn it. Does that make sense? So, God, God is the one that, um, God is the one that leads. Being sincere is more important than knowing everything. Being genuine, all right? Sincerity trumps knowledge every single time. You can, what is it that they say? Truth without love is cruelty. You know, it's cruel. When someone tells you the truth, hard, boom, that's cruel. There needs to be sincerity. There needs to be uh, love. Matthew ten twenty. if you can turn there with me. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So there will come moments in our, in our experiences where God is the one doing the speaking on our behalf. It's not me, it's not Eddie, the great and powerful, it's God. Okay, so when we, when we talk to others about God and we don't know an answer, there may come a time where God will lead us in what we say. But again, this is why I'm, I'm bringing it back to abiding in Christ, because that can only happen in an abiding relationship with Christ. I know you're like, Eddie, man, you keep saying that. I'm, I keep saying it because it's the most important thing. Without Christ, there is nothing. What if you don't want to? You know, and this is Elena's I don't want to face. Um, if you don't want to, then pray about it. That's what I would say. God is, uh, but God is calling us. God is calling us to not only uh, be disciples, but to make disciples. God is calling us to teach, not only to be taught. And I, 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 I mentioned this in the Sabbath school that we sometimes get into holy huddles, right? And it's all about us, you know? And we forget that there's a whole world out there ready to be reached. And I'm not saying we have to do great big things, but it can start with our, our neighborhoods. It can start with our lives, that's, that is, you know, what God wants. And I, I feel like sometimes we don't want to because we're afraid. We're afraid of what might happen. Sometimes we're afraid of success. And I remember um, when I was first, uh, first learning how to get t- share someone the truths of the Bible, it was very intimidating. And I was, yes, in uh, Ma- Matthew, and I remember and then, you know, the, the sweat would, like, 
I, I, would, I would need a shower by the end of a Bible study. And it was, it was very intimidating, you know, and it, and it can be. But the more, the more you, you, um, you work in that same environment, the more you're, you'll be able to grow and it will come second nature. So, I mean, so God is calling all people, not just paid pastors. And this is why I appreciate, like, the, the spirit of, of the, the laity, the people of God, the, the church members. Peter calls us to be a royal priesthood. That's everybody, not just um, paid pastors. Everyone is called to do the work of God. Some others, some differently than others. But everyone is called to minister, and the very word minister is to help others. So what's, what's better help than showing people the word of God? What's better help than showing people uh, how to come into a knowledge of God? Okay, so again, no, you don't need to do this great big thing. I, I, I know we have an evangelism. Whenever we hear the word evangelism, already barriers go up, and it's like, well, that doesn't work. I mean, it's... it's so, because it's, we have a public speaker, and he says, hey, come to Christ, and then th- the people of the community don't come, and it becomes very discouraging, and, and then we say, well, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to be discouraged. I don't want to, you know, I, I, I'm tired of people rejecting me, right? It kind of, they all kind of uh, intertwine. But again, the goal isn't to reach people. What? The goal is to have an experience with Christ, and then from that experience, He will reach the people. God is the one that changes the hearts. It's not us. God is the one that plants the seed. We're agents of that, but God does everything. Nobody comes to Christ because of Eddie, okay? Nobody comes to Christ because, oh, man, that Eddie, you know, he's, he's awesome. Everyone comes to Christ because of Christ. Clear? Amen? All right, but I'm not good. And I mean, I, I just shared with you wh- my own experience. Again, following Jesus will make you better. Following uh, and keep keep doing it. No, don't don't try. No one is born good. No one is born good at what they do. And I know there is a thing as natural talent, but one of the best people, the best athletes, are the ones that don't have that natural talent. Uh, I know I'm, I'm sports oriented. Wes Welker. He's one of the best receivers in the game, but and he's not the best physically or talent-wise, but he catches 100, 112 balls a year, you know, and, and uh, he's the best slot receiver, probably one of the best, because he works hard and he's dedicated to what he does, and it's the same f- with um, with Michael Jordan again that example, he had talent, but he said he worked hard on his talent, so you know. God gives us all a gift, God gives us all a calling, and God wants us to work out that calling in Him. We're not going to be good at first, but don't get discouraged because God is working in our lives. All right, this is the last slide. And uh, Charles Spurgeon said that quote. It says, by perseverance the snail breached the ark. That it's a slow process. And... um, I just, don't, don't give up. Don't give up trying to reach others because your efforts at first aren't working. You know, don't, don't give up because God is calling us to share. And that can be an expression of your life. That can be in a Bible study, like formal or small group, whatever, whatever it is that God is calling you. God is calling us to share. So don't, don't be discouraged. God is leading And we have to believe that if God is good and God is leading, then we have nothing to fear. So I pray, I pray for uh, this this church this morning that we may we may uh, persevere, endure, endure during the 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 trials that are occurring, but also endure in our ministry and our work. One of the the things is is like, while this can be very rewarding, it can be very discouraging because we don't see quick results. We don't see quick results in finding a friend and saying, hey, because nowadays we've been so trained to, we want everything quick, right? Fast food, that why, why is it on the rise? Because people want food quick. Have it your way. It's all about you. 
sometimes God makes us patient so that we can learn to depend on him. So as we, as we study these principles, as we carry them with us in our lives, remember to endure in God and not in this idea that we have to baptize people. Okay, that's, that's the wrong idea. We don't, we don't need baptisms. We don't need money. We need God to reach those people and God to lead the people of Foxborough. And then from that comes the baptism and everything else. So we have to come to a core, but don't, don't give up. Let's, I'm, I'm asking all of you, you know, to, to pray. To pray that God will lead in your life and to pray that God will put peop, uh, people in your life that you can reach. There are people in your life that I will never be able to reach. So if you're thinking, Eddie can do a Bible study for this person, I just don't know, you know, and it'll take time. But there are people in your life that you can reach and, and only you can reach. So I pray that, um, that that may be your prayer too. Please bow your heads with me. Father God in heaven, Lord, our prayer is to put you first, to have you at the very center of our lives, because when you are the center of our lives, you're the one directing our steps, and it's not our ambitions, not our desires, but everything that we are comes from you. Lord, we love you, and we need you. Be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.